Well, hi everybody and welcome to Designers for Learning. This is our 30th webinar and we may have a tiny little group tonight, but I think we're going to have a good conversation nonetheless. Today is uh, Tuesday, June, what is it, June 23rd, 2015. And the purpose of our webinar today is really an open house for the students who participated in the cohort that just concluded in May. Um, it was for the benefit of Grace Centers of Hope. The students in the group um, develop, developed three units of instruction for um, GED preparation. And at this point, I think we've got one of the faculty sponsors uh, or uh, mentors on, Yvonne Earnshaw, I see you're in here, and one of the student designers, Holly. And uh, we have two guests that I've not met before. We've got Joe and Alex, so hopefully we can say hi to them as well. Um, but may maybe we could just start out, Holly, with just a little, uh, a little overview from your perspective on how did things go and how did it um, compare to what you thought the experience was going to be and, and um, how do you think you'll use this experience going forward, hopefully in some positive way? Well, I, I thought that it was, a, it, was a, it was a good experience for me because I had my, my experience in school creating design was, had been so different. And I really appreciated some of the factors that were done for us. It kind of prepped us and set us up for success so that we, we did feel like we were making progress quickly and we knew what we were supposed to be doing. And, and then the, we had the feedback that was so directive. And so my overall feeling for the experience was, was positive. And it, I essentially, it made me feel like, yeah, I can do this, and it's not as complicated as I, I thought it was from at the beginning. If you could um, refresh my memory, we were speaking before we turned the recording on, and Holly um, was describing how she's a, a public school teacher, actually just leaving that position, taking a new one. Uh, but could you describe a little bit about what your background is in terms of instructional design, in terms of your coursework you've had, and then any work experience you've had? Sure. I have been a public school teacher for 18 years. I teach, I've taught K-12 and I've taught adult. And with, I've, I've discovered through my, my, my doctorate classes that I've been designing, essentially I've been designing the entire time. We just call it lesson plans. <laughs> right. and now I'm taking it a step further. And the experience that I've had from all those years of education just it falls in so nicely with learning to be an instructional designer. And so I'm taking everything that I've learned and, you know, I, I know how to write um, the, the different things that we need for the, for the instructional design. I know what the different aspects and parts are supposed to be in there. And so I take what I'm, I'm learning with instructional design and just kind of wrap it all together into a nice, nice bow. You know, this is a great conversation, um, t t kind of a sidebar conversation, but it's always interesting when um, a classroom teacher then kind of looks into the world of instructional design and says, well, that's kind of what I do. <laughs> so why are we considering it a distinct discipline? And I, I think for me anyway, when I look at it, and I've not had the benefit of being in, um, in your role before, so I'm just looking at it again, looking at your world from what I can see from the outside. Um, but I think the, the, the interesting part from, from an instructional design standpoint, that, or the point of distinction rather, is you never know who your client is going to be and who your learners are going to be, whereas um, it tends to be, I would assume in your classroom setting, your learners are a fairly static group for, um, throughout the, the term. And so what we spend a lot of time doing in instructional design is that discovery phase, the analysis phase, trying to figure out who our learners are and what we need to do to try to tailor our instruction to try to reach them. Um, so does that kind of ma match up with your perspective from going from, again, the classroom, designing a lesson for the classroom versus mm -hmm. like, taking on a project like this? Can you, can you talk about that a little bit as far as trying to get your head around who the learners were in, in our case with, uh, with the Grace Centers of Hope project? Mm -hmm. it, it's, that's, that is true. That's very true that the, the students are different. I've, I've recently been, well, half of the, my career, I've taught English as a second language. And so I've been doing all subjects. 
And so that's kind of also helped me to think in different terms of, okay, I'm not just a Spanish teacher. I have to teach, you know, math. I have to teach science. Mm -hmm. So I'm not scared of trying different subject areas. And then having such different learners that we had with this, this internship, that was very eye-opening and having to cons consider who are we, who are we creating this for? It's not just a, a generic class that anybody can take, but it is specifically for that, that's that, that group. So I did, ex I did have that experience and that was eye opening for me. Yeah. And um, just to reiterate your group where it was unit one, um, I just put a link in the chat room for um, the, those that might not be familiar. This will take you to our virtual design studio. And if you scroll down the page, you'll see the students deliverables, including the design plan, the prototype and the final deliverable. And again, Han, um, um, I'm sorry, Holly was in um, the scientific method group. And um, what I really thought was strong about your, I was just flipping through them again today. Um, if you click on final deliverable, it'll take you to their, um, their specific unit. I thought yours was really strong. and It probably has a lot to do with your background is um, it takes the learner through the lesson really well, I think. Um, and even though we're using a fairly uh, benign, generic, <laughs> however you want to call it, template, we're not using any robust e-learning platform where we're using PowerPoint, but still at the same time, time, you, you, I think your, your group did a great job of thinking about the learner actually walking through the unit from the first screen to the last and, and walking through what their practice opportunities are and giving them the opportunity to see what the answers are and, and taking them off to examples. So um, can you kind of just talk about that a little bit for us, um, Holly, as far as the design, when you were so constrained by, constrained by just using a PowerPoint as the prototype template? Sure. One of the, the, the strategies that we used in creating our design was scaffolding. I felt that, and we, as my group felt, that it was important that we scaffold because of the unique background of our learners. And so we tried to take baby steps and offer them opportunities to gen, gently take the, the learning experience one step deeper. And so we tried to set them up for success that way. Yeah, and I noticed, um, I'm just clicking through, and I think, and I know your group probably split some of these different things. It looked like Hannah maybe created some of the, um, um, I think it was, what was the, um, the quiz, is it, what's it called, Quizlet, I think she had, and then a, a Go Animate maybe that she'd worked on. Um, and so that was another, uh, I think, interesting thing that your group did. You, while you were designing on the PowerPoint template, you still took the opportunity to send learners off to other applications, whether it be on the web or whatever it may be, and then bring them back to the PowerPoint to take them to the next stages mm -hmm. of the lesson. Mm -hmm. um, that's cool. Um, and Yvonne, I, I kind of want to bring you in the conversation. I don't know if you have, do you have your um, audio handy? I do. Oh, you do. Okay. <laughs> well, maybe you could share with us a little bit. You were working with um, a different group. You were working with group two, right? And they were doing the um, United States history, social studies. Um, so can you give us a little sense of how things worked in your group? And again, uh, Yvonne was our faculty advisor. Sure. Um, and I guess just to provide a sort of a brief background, um, I finished my doctorate last year from Florida State University. And prior to going into a doctoral program, I um, worked in industry, mostly in a consulting role um, as an instructional designer and developer and project manager, um, and mostly in the Research Triangle Park part of North Carolina. So high tech was kind of my main area, um, but then I worked for sort of all different kinds of companies. So I've, I've seen it from kind of the outside of what to do. And then, you know, also as a graduate student, saw very heavily how theory and models and principles of design kind of fall into that. Whereas when I was in industry, it was mostly your kind of what Dave Merrill calls like designers by assignment, where it's, you know, a lot of people that I was working with didn't have formal backgrounds. So one of the things that I really love about designers for learning and this idea of service-based learning is that students are able to get real-world experience um, 
and, and something that I found as someone who actually hired instructional designers is you're getting, you're getting that experience that is so valuable. You're getting, you know, skills of working on a virtual team, but you're learning about really the process and working with an actual client. So kind of all of this ties into this wonderful project. Um, so yes, I oversaw the U.S. history group. Um, and the original assignment was really to cover U.S. history and whatever that looked like um, in about an hour's worth of time. And as we kind of went through the process, um, and hopefully Paige will be joining soon, but we, you know, Paige and I were very closely with our three graduate students who are from three very different universities and walk them through the process of, okay, here's how you create your design plan and all the things that you need to take into account, you know, designing this course of U.S. history in a one-hour time period. Um, and then kind of initially sent that off to um, our client and then got very, very wonderful feedback from them. Um, and, and kind of as we were going through the process, there's always, you know, challenges that you encounter anytime that you're working with a client. And so we had some of those challenges where they came back to us and said, hey, you know, we had this great idea of all of this information, but there's so much information. And now that you've kind of built out this course, it's seven hours long and we're really only looking for an hour long course. How do we kind of cut that back, scale it back, um, so it's, so it's going to be better, you know, in the end, obviously you're dealing with a client, but you're also dealing with, you know, this audience that you have to design this course for. So what's, you know, what are all the things that you're dealing with in kind of those situations of, okay, here's a client, but you're really trying to get the needs met of your particular audience members. So it was a wonderful, I think it's just a really, really great experience. I would highly encourage anybody to you know, apply and go through the process because it, it gets you that experience of, you know, working with a, a team and working on a project. Mm -hmm. And you really did. And Paige did join us. Hi, Paige. We're talking about hey, guys. <laughs> We just were getting to your unit. And um, you, your unit in particular, you had a really strong group of designers um, were, who worked actually well, uh, well above and beyond when we were tallying up the hours for the group. And it has, to do with, it has to do with exactly what, um, Yvonne, you were starting to say. I think this is the third crack we've taken at U.S. history. And um, it's, what's really interesting about preparing students for the GED is they have so much history already themselves, personal history. Some have um, made it all the way almost right up until graduation, but for whatever reason didn't finish. And then you have some that maybe uh, have completed their formal education in ninth grade or eighth grade or whatever it may be. And so it's a little bit, it's, it's a challenge to say how much, and plus the internet is filled with facts. So <laughs> we don't need to really sit there and drill a bunch of facts in their heads. And so what I think all the groups have done a good job that have, again, tried to tackle this U.S. history or giving uh, some type of summary is going back to what the testing standards are. And, um, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, we're in a situation where we're creating instruction for a test to prepare people for a test. And it's not like the students have to sit there and it's not a fact-based test where they have to remember dates and things like that. It's more putting these um, these time periods and these people and um, uh, events into context uh, it, w in regard to how the, the test is, uh, is asking the question. So I don't know, Paige or, or Yvonne, did you, how did, the, how did you help steer the students as, as far as chopping up their unit? Because as we were saying, they had so much content and then they had to scale it back. Um, was it just a matter of, of cropping it at certain dates in history or did you also try to get them to think about in terms of how the, the students would be tested on the material? Um, I think we let we gave them a lot of liberty at first to propose how they wanted to do it and in general they did a pretty good job wouldn't you say Yvonne um, but I, I don't think we we really gave them any hard parameters you know we would just kind of try to have one of them come to the client when we would have the group webinars and get feedback on their ideas more than anything so but I think they separated it pretty well. And, you know, some of it was just pretty clear, you know, if you're jumping from, you know, World War II to Vietnam, I mean, there were just some hard points, stopping points there that they could kind of draw from. 
Right. And um, Paige, this is your second crack at this. Your, your first was as a student. Your second was as a um, GSA, which stands for Graduate Student, student Association Member for AECT, which as I don't even know what is AECT, <laughs> Association for Educational Communications and Technology. Technology. So you're the AECT GSA <laughs> student yeah. member um, and was and a mentor for your group. Um, so can you talk a little bit about that? Like how, how did your perception change of working on a project like this going from a student to then going um, as a, a, a mentor for the for a next group? It, it would be hard for me to imagine being a mentor without first having been on the other side of it. And I think that was a real advantage for me, especially our group, because our, um, our history group, which would be my second what term in the program um, you know the the scope was so huge and we had kind of some type a perfectionist type students I can't tell I can't see who all was who all's here if any of our people but I mean that in the most you know positive way but um, I think I was able to if anything be more of an encourager kind of cheerleader to say you know you guys this is you know the expectations have to be met but at the same time you know don't kill yourself doing it you guys are doing a good job so i think i had you know a little more um kind of a background and schema to know that they were on the right track um sometimes they felt like they were lost but they really weren't you know and i would kind of relate it back to my previous experience with my teammate you know a single teammate so like the um when I was a student designer, I had one teammate, and then with this new iteration, we jumped in, and there were three. So mm -hmm. there were some challenges there that were different, you know, as far as scheduling, living in different time zones, that sort of thing. But yeah, I think just, and it helped, I, I can only speak, I'm kind of speaking for you, Yvonne, but one of the things, I think Yvonne coming in kind of late, maybe like a month later than some of us into the project in the planning stages, I think my having experiences on the student side, I was kind of able to catch her up and give her some context too. So that was really great. Yeah, you brought up a lot of really um, important points that this is a volunteer endeavor. And so we did, in, and we, Paige, you and I talked about it quite a bit during, and when we could see that there was getting to be some scope creep and then the students were working well beyond, we got pretty nervous because we really, when we but were budgeting, I think we were saying, what, 40 to 50 hours of a volunteer is what we were asking the students to commit to. And when we were seeing it doubling, <laughs> kind of pushing yeah. that even beyond, um, we got um, kind of nervous. And so, but, but also part of that is, is what you're saying as well, um, as far as the students know more than they think they know. And so I think a lot of times you kind of get, you sense that they're getting stuck. And it, they just, your role, I think, was great in that you just give them a little shove <laughs> to say, you know, more than you think you know, and um, help the client understand where you're stuck. And then I think that worked out well with your group where um, when the scope got really big, just going back to the client saying, you know, and, and I think that, that came through during our evaluation process when they reviewed the prototype. And they could see, as, as Yvonne was saying, this is huge, and we really only have the students for an hour to crack. And so if we could try to figure out a way to tailor it. And, um, and so I think through communication, I think you guys did a great job reining all that in and, and getting it, it to a nice one hour deliverable. And just to reiterate, they're the group two for those that are, are looking at the um, deliverables. And we are lucky enough to have uh, Willette join us. Willette is in, I believe, group three, and then we will have touched them all, I think, as far as all the groups, right, Willette? And do you yes. have, oh, excellent, do you have your audio? You do, obviously, have your audio. You can hear me and you can talk, right? Yes, I hear you. Excellent. So um, you just joined us, and so we've had the opportunity to hear from um, from Holly in Group One, and then Paige and Yvonne gave us a quick little overview of how things progressed with their with their group. Is there anything you wanted to share um, with yours? I have some questions for you, but I just wanted to give you a, the, an open floor just to say how you thought things went with your um, with your design team and how things turned out with your unit, the math unit. Well, um, I think it was a, a great opportunity for me to learn how an instructional design project works, uh, learning the process. Um, I admittedly, you know, um, committed one of the, like, uh, I don't know, cardinal sins of instructional design in that I went into it thinking that 
I had to create everything. And I was kind of late on getting to the point where of going out and finding things that are already out there that will be a good uh, uh, content that's already created that would meet our learning objectives. Um, so it was good um, to, to go through that process. Sometimes you learn things better by experiencing hardships. Um, so, um, yes, it was good to go through that and also a uh, positive side of working with other instructional design students and learning from them because we all brought something different, a different perspective to the table. We all had various um, strengths. And so we had some, um, some complementary strengths and some non-overlapping weaknesses. So that made it good to work together. And uh, I really uh, encourage those that are interested in the, the work of the students to track their progression. And this group in particular, I, um, and, and I'm sure I could make the same argument for all of them, but I really, really think the difference between your prototype and your um, final deliverable, it just shows how important this evaluation phase is that we have between both the um, design plan to the prototype and then from the prototype to the final deliverable. And I remember, and here's some questions I mentioned, I had some questions for you, Willette, but um, you had some really good questions for the client as well as for the facilitators as far as the presentation of your material and um, how, I guess, for lack of a better term, fancy things had to be. And I think without exception, everybody was really impressed with actually the simplicity of the little um, icons and things that you were using uh, to show fractions. And, um, and could you talk about that a little bit? As, as far, I know we've been talking a lot about the design up to this point. But um, mm -hmm. in terms of the actual development and turning in that final deliverable and how those design decisions you made as far as how you were going to present the content. Well, I think once we got on the same page and got some clarity from um, the evaluation team, um, the person who was responsible for those really outstanding graphics on our design is not on the line today, Elaine. Uh, but she found all of those uh, really good graphics to really just make it visual for the learner. And we know in mathematics instruction how important a good visual can be to bring home the point of the concept we're trying to teach in mathematics. So once we uh, got that idea of how important the image is and, you know, the type of images we can use, we, we just went with that, uh, even um, to the point of... Uh, media selection and the type of media we we use and what media we use looking at things on Khan Academy and th that sort of thing so once we knew and understood the power of the visual and the uh, parameters for the use of visuals uh, we really um, endeavored to make our final deliverable much better than our um, sort of uh, homelier in comparison prototype. <laughs> no, and, uh, and I think it's, it's really, I think it comes up every time, I'm sure in any, probably every design project is the fidelity of your graphics and your media that you're using. And um, we do have bigger picture visions of thinking of one day taking these modules and then and turning them into more robust e-learning modules down the road. These are all Creative Commons, so anybody can take that and do the same if they're interested. Um, but for example, um, I, I, I keep calling on you or mentioning to you, and, and I think this is probably the third webinar we've had that I'm so, I just love the cupcakes. <laughs> just think oh. they're great <laughs> because they're very simple and then you've color coordinated them for um, the problems that you're working on so the students can see, you know, is it six twelfths and then six of them are pink and if it's uh, the blue section, it's you know, two are blue out of the twelve. Um, and it's very, the, the graphics, again, the fidelity is very low. There's not much to it. There's nothing's dancing or moving or <laughs> um, right. it's a matter of changing the colors of the, um, of the items, but it's, it's very effective. And, um, and again, I really noticed with your group that that type of enhancement really was, um, was reflected between your prototype and your, and your final deliverable. Um, Thanks. I'll pass that on to the other teammates. <laughs> And I think I, I mentioned it also with, I think, probably both groups. Or if I didn't on the second, I, I should have. Um, I think all groups did probably the, some of the strongest work we've seen so far of getting into the heads of the learners in terms of not what necessarily what they know, but like how will they actually progress through the unit. 
And um, I think that was a strong factor in all of the, um, the units that we saw in this cohort that you really, can, again, can watch um, what the designers were thinking in terms of the learners are going to start at screen one, we're going to take them through different areas, we're going to send them out to maybe watch a Khan Academy video or a YouTube video or do some type of quiz and bring them back. And that's exactly the idea um, when we really aren't focusing particularly on uh, robust e-learning uh, development, but rather um, thinking through the design of what the learners are going to be doing. So that's, that's great. Um, and then I just want to open it up to, um, I see we have a couple guests with us. I, I don't know Joe or Alex, and I don't think I know Fel uh, Felicia, do I? And I, if I do, if, if I know any of you, I apologize because <laughs> I'm just not catching your name. But did anybody have any questions for the group or any comments? Uh, yeah, if I, if I might. Please, go ahead. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Alex. Um, I'm going to be starting a master's program in instructional design in August. And uh, I was just curious about um, dealing with your workload, um, either at work or at school, um, while doing a project like this. Was it pretty noticeable? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, am I laughing out loud? <laughs> Sorry. I don't know how my, my audio was unmuted. <laughs> that was hot. Oh, I got it muted so that can hear me. Until yes. I can talk more. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Holly, do you want to give them a, a sense of, um, I think, again, we were, we were targeting 40 to 50 hours for students' design time for the 16-week project. Did you feel that was about what you put in, or I can't remember what you put down for your essay? It, it, uh, yes, that, it, it was exactly what we were told to expect. It's just funny how whenever you get that momentum going and getting in, get into these different projects, that it seems like you have designers for learning, and then you have that other project, and the other project, plus your full-time job, plus your full-time school, and it's just so overwhelming. But hey, whenever you get that, that final product done, it feels really, really good. Yeah. Um, and then Paige, I don't know, um, we talked a little bit about your, the designers on your team actually doubling and almost tripling in, in one case. Um, but how did you feel it was from a student standpoint when you were a student uh, working in your classwork plus your regular job and then doing this? How did, how did that balance out for you? Um, well, I mean, I, I agree with Holly to a large degree. Um, you know, I work full time and I'm in a doctoral program and I was still, I think I was finished with classes though, luckily, mm -hmm. um, when I was in the fall, when I was a, in, as a student, but, um, you know, it, it was a lot of evening work, you know, trying to really working with my partner and finding times that work. So a lot of times we'd work from eight till 11 you know, in the evenings. And she and I worked synchronously a lot of times. So we would be on um, Google Hangouts, but yet working on a PowerPoint and, you know, um, Google Drive. And then we could just kind of yell at each other, check in on each other as we worked. But um, it, it's challenging, but I think it's really important. Um, I don't think you really get a good sense of, at least in my, in my opinion, a service learning type situation like this unless you do have a lot of things going on at once and you have to prioritize and you have to plan so um, it, it's a lot of work so if you're for those of you who are saying that you're interested in it as you you know progress through your master's programs or whatnot just be aware that you know to do it right you have to commit to do it so try you know try to prioritize it and I think that's the most important thing because when you really start going through the jumpstart orientation and you start reading, you know, I'm committing to this many hours, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. It, it makes it real to you that you are putting your name on something, your integrity, your professionality on something, and you're going to complete it. So that's what really stuck with me when I was, you know, working as a student. And there was a group, I think, during my, you know, semester as a student that basically dropped out, kind of fell apart. And I just, you know, I thought, gosh, you know, after putting your name on the line and saying you're going to do it, you need to pull through and do a good job. So. Yeah, and, and that, you know, we're growing and learning too, and that you're right in the site, you were the second cohort to go through, and mm -hmm. um, I think what we tried to do in the third is be more transparent as far as, it's, we really do think you need to spend 50, 50 hours, I think with 50 hours is what we said, to do a good job. And, and, and you know, if you, I think we put that out there in the, at the application phase and saying, 
if this is a hurdle for you, if you can't commit to 50 hours, it's probably best you not turn in your application. And I think that maybe was a little unclear or less clear maybe in the second cohort that that was like a true, uh, true guideline rather than, uh, well, we think it's going to take you about that. Um, but to your point, yeah, unfortunately, we, we, we did have in the second cohort, some, a group didn't finish, but, um, but every, every, every other group I think is, has done a great job finishing. Um, and that actually brings up a point, um, and I'll, t I'll Felicia, I see your question here too in the chat room. I'll, I'll mention, I'll address that in a second. Um, but for Al Alex or anybody else who's interested um, in understanding how the cohort works, uh, when the students are done working with it, we really encourage them to use the work as part of their portfolio and also part of your job interviews. And so we, had to, we give everybody a letter of recognition that outlines everything that they've done and um, the hours they've, they've volunteered. And we give, again, the, I mentioned already, the, um, all the instruction that's created is released under a Creative Commons license. And so you, you have the ability to use that. It's not like you're going to be locked out of the content, after, which unfortunately sometimes happens when you design. You actually get locked out of the work yourself. Um, so there is that ability then, you've done all this great work for, for the good of Grace Centers of Hope, but really this is a, a two-way street and we really want to make sure that you have the ability to use this experience to your advantage when you go out on a, on a job interview. Um, and let me also just address real quickly, I don't know if I, can everybody see the chat room? I'm not sure. I never know who can see what, but there is a chat, chat window going here. And Felicia was just asking, um, she, or mentioning that she's in a master's program in instructional design and wants to know how the cohorts work. And so I would say everyone has been a little bit different. We, we're now about to go into our fourth, and we're going to take a little bit different approach. Maybe this is a good way to spend the last 10, 15 minutes of our time here today and, and get some feedback from folks on, on what you think about these potential changes. But up to this point, it's been an application process. And so students, um, and we've really limited our cohort to those that are enrolled, currently enrolled students in instructional design programs with the idea that we would then have the support of their faculty sponsor. Um, to help us out, help meaning help me out and, and others in terms of the facilitation. Um, but what we um, but we're, what we're going to do in the fall is um, we're looking to take this experience and put it on the Canvas.net open online course platform. So a MOOC by any other name. And rather than go through an application process, we want to throw these design almost like a design challenge based again on adult basic education, very much same type of topics that we've been working with. There are so many, there's so much need for us to create this um, GED test preparation material. And so we would like to offer a six week experience where the students are um, taken through the jumpstart the page mentioned um, and have the opportunity to create a design plan. And then based on the quality of the students work, we'll make our selection from there rather than doing it through an application process. So some of the numbers that people have been throwing out are fairly large, um, which I spoke with in our last webcast. If you go back to webcast number 29, we spoke with a woman who, uh, who facilitated a MOOC on the canvas.net platform and she had 2,000 people enroll in her course. So that's quite different from Paige. I don't know, what did we have in your course uh, cohort, like nine or 10? We had nine or 10 this time. Um, so this will be taking it to scale in, in, in kind of a crazy way. But again, the idea being through those six weeks, there'll be a little bit less direct hands-on uh, mentorship, one-to-one -one mentorship, and obviously with a group of 2,000. But the idea being, if you stick with us and you um, appear that you, you're trying hard and you're doing a good job, if we whittle things down and we get to a smaller number, we can then um, complete the remaining 10 weeks of a traditional 16-week cohort, cohort um, with a much smaller group. Um, so that's what we're thinking about doing. So Felicia, I don't know, Felicia, if you have um, audio, if, you, if that answers your question or if you had any other comments about what I just mentioned. Okay, but Paige, what do you, you want to kind of give me, I know you and I have had a, a sidebar conversation about this, but um, you went through the application review process, and unfortunately, I think we had to weed out at least half of the people who applied, which I think is a, a shame. So we're, that's one of the reasons we're moving to this other model, but what do you think about this idea of not having an application process, but rather having their design plan be part of their criteria to whether or not they go, they go on to the next phase of the cohort? 
I, I think it's a neat idea. Um, I think, like you said, it would allow some of the individuals that we said, they're just not quite ready yet. You know, they're so close, but maybe they need more classes or whatnot. I think having this kind of introductory round might really allow us to include them and, um, you know, maybe give them an idea going forward of, you know, what they need to do. Um, because we did, we, you know, when it came down to it, most of the time when we were looking at applications, students who were, had finished their master's and maybe had a little bit of experience or those who were in doctoral programs, typically we would rate them higher than those who were early on in a master's program just because they didn't have the ID coursework um, credentials that the others did. So I think this would be a great way to, you know, include a broader range of students for sure. Yeah, and um, as you're speaking, I was uh, back channeling with Felicia, and she mentioned um, that she didn't realize, I guess she didn't realize that um, she wouldn't qualify because of she's already completed her program, um, but I just wanted to clarify, we're going to kind of do away with that requirement and make it for everybody. I would say about probably 80% of the inquiries I get for Designers for Learning are, um, are actually students who've already quit, um, finished their program and are actively looking for a job and need some experience to add to their portfolio. And so it seems a shame that we're, for, you know, for our purposes, because again, I thought that we'd be able to tap into the faculty sponsorship a little bit more than we have. Um, anyway, that we've, we've yeah. historically cut off all of those people who really want to participate. So Felicia, just to clarify that, um, you can definitely participate in the MOOC that we'll be doing in the fall. It's, it's everybody, and actually, Another wrinkle, because the way Canvas.net works, we really can't exclude anyone. So if you're a dentist or you're a whatever, and you want to try your hand at instructional design, not to say that you'll do the best of the class, or maybe you will do the best of the class, I have no idea. But uh, <laughs> Interesting. So we'll, we'll be taking everybody, and then, like I said, through the, the hurdles, you have to jump as far as going through the jumpstart orientation and then doing the uh, the first cut of the design plan. Hopefully at that point we'll see, uh, we'll see who's got, got it and ready to take the, uh, the next jump with us. So. Holly, made a re Jen, Holly made a really good point about um, how this mirrors the Pacific Core competition that AECT does. So that might, as far as the, you might be able to kind of add to that, Holly, but it might be some, you know, an idea would be to talk to individuals like Karen Kaminsky and some of them who have, you know, worked at those early stages of the Pacific Core competition. They usually start with like a big webinar to gauge interest and, you know, it, it ends up narrowing down into kind of a more targeted competition, smaller cohort. So, yeah, I think that's a really good point, Holly. It's an excellent point, and it and actually it is we have borrowed quite a bit from them. I don't know if you know, um, Jill Stefaniak is on our board for Designers for Learning, and she's been involved a bit with um, Pacific Core in the in the in the background uh, administration or whatever. And um, and so yeah, so Jill Jill was working with us on this idea of how do we do this? How do we uh, go from an application based cohort to doing it much more like, um, and I think what, what what's interesting about Pacific Corp, um, when we were, were speak, I actually spoke with some of the folks last year at AACT. Um, I would love to some, someday work with them because I, their, their projects are canned, is that right? They're like canned scenarios versus mm -hmm. designing for, uh, for an actual purpose. So wouldn't that be cool if we could somehow figure out a way to, to dovetail our work with theirs? But great, great point, Holly. That's very well, point is very well taken. Well, I don't want to keep everybody on a beautiful summer night, um, and I really want to thank everybody who joined us. Are there any other questions or comments um, from anybody in the group? I, I would like to end everything by thanking everybody, uh, for sure, for all the work you've done, and, and hopefully we'll have several of you that are on this conversation right now joining us in the fall as well. Oh uh, Yeah, just if, if I may. Sure, please. Uh, yeah, well, when are you accepting? Uh, it's probably posted on your site, but when are you accepting applications? Um, we actually won't be um, even worried about worrying about applications. We're just going to open it up. I, I'm guessing we have to do, go through quite a few hurdles with Canvas.net to actually get our course approved on their platform. And so we're in that process right now of pre presenting them with our design concept. And so I'm thinking we'll probably offer the course October 1st, if I had to guess. 
and it will just be an open online course. And so it will be six weeks and we'll go through a jumpstart orientation. You will work through the initial design plan document. And then um, if you're still interested and want to continue on and go to the prototype stage and then also the uh, final deliverable stage, um, it, it we'll kind of move that off the canvas.net platform and move it on to more of our like what we did this last time where it's a smaller cohort of I don't even know the numbers I'm just guessing at this point but let's say we have 25 students at that point that want to stick with us um, so no application that's the good news okay great how, and how do I express uh, interest should I contact you or somebody um, else yeah you know what let me get you the um, we'll get you on our um, let's see if you go to our website the contact form if you just fill that out um, I'll get you on our mailing list and so as we update things you'll just be part of our mailing list is that does that work for you yeah that's great thank you very much sure okay well good luck to Holly Holly I don't know if you have your mic on still but good luck to you thank Holly's, you so much Jennifer Holly's heading off to uh, to Russia right is that right duh duh <laughs> duh <laughs> I leave August 3rd and fly out August 3rd from, from um, Wilmington. That is fantastic for a two-year commitment, two-year contract, and yes. um, that's fantastic. And thank you to Willette and Yvonne and Paige and all everybody else who uh, has joined us today. And, and thanks, and have a great summer. Thank you, Jen. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.